mathematician and economist. Uh, he's at UC Irvine, he's shown as student there. Um, he was elected to the uh, United States National Academy of Sciences in 2001. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so, Professor Don Sari. Okay, thank you. This is going to be a partial commercial. What I want to do is we got some very bright mathematicians here. Uh, and I want to try and get more of you interested in the mathematics of the social sciences. I had that from yesterday. All right, so we'll do it this way. All right, the math. Okay. It died. I mean, we're gonna. I'll get it fixed in a second. Uh, okay. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So much goes wrong in this area, and I just throw you one of them. <laughs> Things that go wrong, and actually. Uh, the value, there's a lot of value that's added to the social sciences that can come only from mathematicians. And I really think the problems in the social sciences, you know, my training, a lot of my work has been in the physical sciences. But then I got interested in the social sciences and found out, wow, there's so much going on here, different structures, different kinds of problems. I still work in the physical sciences. Social sciences are a great problems. But, all right. <laughs> and ahead with this, let's talk, you know, we're going to have this reception right after. And I don't know if you know how uh, the beverage was selected. Steve Rager, what he did is he put together a committee. And what he did is he had 15 people, and they wrote down their preferences of what they want to serve tonight. Six of them were milk people. They wanted milk. <laughs> if milk isn't available, why are we here? <laughs> Five of them, they came to Wisconsin. <laughs> they prefer beer, wine, milk. And the other four are from California. They want wine, beer, milk. So what did they do? You vote. Well, let's see, that's pretty obvious. Six vote for milk, five vote for beer, four vote for wine, and there is the rain. They got in the car to drive down to the local beverage store to buy a keg of milk. <laughs> <laughs> when they got there, they found out, <coughs> said, lucky you didn't want beer. Because well, some Math professors were here, and they bought us all out. So there's no beer. No big deal. I mean, come on, take a look. Milk, wine, exactly. So you would still choose wine. That's clear. I mean, if you don't believe me, let's go through with the compute. Milk, wine. Let's see. There's six milk lovers. Go through wine. Uh-oh. There's nine wine lovers over milk. 60% of these people really prefer last place wine, first place milk. Well, let's check what would happen if we would compare milk and beer. Let's see. Uh-oh. Nine people prefer beer to milk. So what we have is that milk wins. Milk is the winning alternative. And yet these same people, no one changing their preferences, prefer anything <laughs> to milk. <laughs> and let's look at the last, uh, beer versus wine. If we look at beer versus wine, there's the wine lovers, two-thirds of them. So what is it that we have? By making pairwise comparisons, wine, which came in last place, is preferred by these people either of the other two alternatives, and the same people prefer either of the other two alternatives, no. the ranking is precisely the opposite. Now, you look like a pure brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, how would you like a beer? Yeah. <laughs> I know there's some beer lovers in here. How would you select beer? Anyone have an idea on how you would have liked beer? Whatever eats the uh, smallest hole in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way you would like beer is with a very well known strategy a runoff election. Take a look, and in the first election, wine is going to be dropped out. And then we have the runoff between milk and beer, and I already showed you that beer will be. Now, I should have excluded department chairs and other administrators from this lecture. 
because they will be able to see that by that really an election outcome need not re, uh, reflect what the voters want, and may reflect the choice of the voters. This is the problem, this is the problem that where we need the muscle power, where we need the expertise of mathematics to try to understand why this can occur. What happens and why. In fact, um, uh, that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of this lecture, why this happens. And the first mathematician to look at this problem was John Charles Cabora in 1770. Now, Jean-Charles de Borda was interested in fluid dynamics, etc. There's a statue. See that thing he's holding in his hand? He invented a machine that could determine the length, you know, distances very accurately. And with that, that machine is what determined the length of a meter. He was chair of the committee who developed the metric system, so he used his steam. Now, Let's see what goes wrong with the plurality vote. Suppose tomorrow morning, the president of your university, Brown, states that from now on, we're going to rank students according to the number of A's they receive. What's wrong with that? Well, you see what's wrong with that is that you have that one student who got an A in gym and F in everything else, will be ranked above the students that got all B's. <laughs> and what is the plurality vote? The plurality vote is exactly the same type of scheme. It just looks at the first place. It doesn't look at your B's, your C's, your D's. And in fact, if you go back and look at that beverage example, you will see that Y had A's or B's. That's it. And the other candidates did not. They were bottom And so that is really what happens. And so what Borda has stated is that we need to assign points to the candidates according to how they're ranked. And in fact, his scheme was if you had three candidates, you give two points to your first place candidate, one point to your second, and zero to your third. The exact numbers don't matter as long as the difference between weights is the same number, the same value. Well, uh, if you have five candidates, like the grade A, B, C, D, F, that would be four, three, two, one, zero. In other words, the four-point grade system. But the choice of the weights matters, because with the beverage example that I gave you, you can get seven different election rankings just by choosing the different weights. Three of them involve ties, four of them are, are strict rankings. So the question then is, which one of these methods, which one of these weights is the best one? And this goes over into over a large number of other areas. So this is, I'm using and the probability of the statistics, not parametric statistics, it includes a large number of different areas. And it recently was solved by mathematics, and I'll give you a sense of how I did that. But I want to take a look at the mathematician's table. So I stated I would like to get more mathematicians involved in these types of issues. You see, what we have is we have good news and bad news. And I'm going to try to show you how bad it can get. But the mathematician's table, where we can really add a lot, is that our approach is we tend to look at things to try to find a systematic theory rather than an ad hoc approach. And in fact, what has happened in a large amount, if you look at the literature, it tends to be ad hoc. This example or that example, etc. Mathematicians have, by the way we're trained, we know how to try to create an approach to make it systematic. Okay, for example, something goes wrong, how likely is it? For three candidates. For three candidates, the result is about a three candidate closely contested elections. Expect 70% of the time that the election outcome will change depending on how many points you give to a first place, 
a second place candidate. You give serial number. 70% of the time you have to expect to report. Uh, that was done with a graduate student of mine uh, uh, several years back, uh, Maria Pitarum. And uh, <coughs> the key trick, there are two tricks on there, but one of the key tricks is the computational trick, which was just messy. And we had to use some differential geometry. Singular points But actually, what happens is you have more candidates, more candidates, or five candidates, everything gets counted. For example, here I have a, what do I have? A five nine, nine voters. Nine voters. And here's the rank two prefer and to bar to Connie to Vienna. Two prefer and to Vienna to Connie to bar, etc. And they're trying to find the person who wrote the best book of these four authors. Who should be the winner? <coughs> well, we could vote for one. If we vote for one, take a look. Uh, Anne, Anne is four, nobody else gets four points. So Anne's the winner. We all know that there's another method that says vote for two. So if we vote for two, there they are. Notice B, you didn't get any votes before. Has a lot of second place votes. So now B wins. Vote for three. Let's be honest. Voting for three is a politically correct way of voting against somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we're going to vote for three, then all we have to do is find out how many times a candidate is bottom ranked. A is bottom ranked, B is bottom ranked, D is bottom ranked, not C. So vote for three, C wins. <laughs> uh, here we have nine people, we got three different uh, winners. And so we have to try to find out which one of these three winners is the real winner. And so I guess we could use board account, which would be three, two, one, zero. So adding up the first place, adding up the second, adding up the third. Who do you think is going to win, A, B, or C? Yeah, you're right, D. <laughs> Again, a very simple example. Anyone can win. Do I trust the election outcome? No way. Not anymore. <laughs> I don't trust them at all. Uh, because they really reflect the voting method that you happen to be using. And in fact, using different weights, it turns out, with a simple example, I can get 18 different election rankings that don't have times. 18 of them, where they rank them. First and last, everything's horrible. <coughs> and it's about 85% of the time, you have to expect the outcome will change depending on the number of voters. Once you get to six candidates, and it's a closely contested six candidate election, and you use the same type of thing, it's about 99% of the time you have to expect the outcome to change, depending on which voting method you're going to use. Ouch. Well, that's how we select our leaders. Well, in general, if you have n candidates, I can create a, an example of profile where there are n minus 1 times n minus 1 factorial, strict electing ranking. The voters don't change their minds. They hold the best. All we do is change the number of points we give to first place, the second place, the third place, etc., and tally the ballots in a different way. In France, we started with 16 candidates in the 2003 election. Stick 16 in there, you get 15 times 15 factorial. <laughs> yeah, but 19.5 trillion different election rankings. <laughs> 19, and, okay, but wait a minute, wait a minute. There's only 6 billion people in the world. How can you create an example? Now, you only need about 40 or 50 voters to create such an example. So in a room about the number of voters we have here, we have 16 candidates. Yeah, we could come pretty close to getting an example. You have a ranking, this ranking, you have that ranking, etc. By changing the weights, we probably have something. All right. You think that's bad? Let me show you what else can happen. What you're doing now is uh, you're trying to select someone to your social club, be president of your social club, or whatever you want. <coughs> and I 
rigid so that it's, you can see that A is in first place, B is in second place, C is in third place, D is in fourth. I've got the data all set up right there for you. So you see that A wins, and wins. So you go over, you pick up the phone, and you're going to go call Ann. Ann, you won. But just as you're picking up the phone, Deanna answers, calls you. And Deanna tells you, you know, I'm dropping off. She's no longer a candidate. Are you going to have another election? No. But take a look. Those two people right there, who would they vote for? They would vote for power. And these four people, who would they vote for? For power. 11, 10, 9, the outcome would reverse. I know of no group that has a second election, but they should. In fact, suppose uh, it wasn't Vienna that dropped out, but Ann. These three voters are not going to vote for Connie. These six voters are not going to vote for Deanna. 12, 10, 8. In fact, with this simple example, this very simple example right here, it turns out, oh, it turns out, <laughs> it turns out that if you drop any candidate or any two candidates, then the outcome just flips. It's the other way around. Exactly the opposite. So who do these candidates really want? Do they want Anne or do they want Deanna? And I think that the evidence, if you look at the total thing, says Deanna is favored, but Anne got away. And this conclusion holds in general for almost any ways except the board account. Okay, so you see what happens. If you got five candidates, what happens is I can create examples, simple examples, using probably no more than about 12 voters or something like that. For the five candidates, where what you're going to have is four times four factorial uh, different election rankings. Depending on if you use a plurality vote for vote for two or vote for three or whatever one you use. And if candidates start dropping up, you can get the ranking keeps getting shuffled all over the place. Let me give you an example from the Gallup poll of two weeks ago. The Gallup poll of two weeks ago used the following voting method. Two voting methods for the people. Same people, nobody changed their mind. Vote for your favorite president of the president since World War II. Ronald Reagan won. Vote for the president that you think was the worst since World War II. That's your vote, you know, for poor <laughs> type thing. Ronald Reagan won. <laughs> <laughs>
We're going to put F back in and drop E out, and I'm going to ask you to use a random number generator to select a ranking for it. And we're going to do that all the way along. So I'm getting a horrible, horrible list of rankings. And the answer is, it doesn't matter. No matter what you se uh, selected, no matter what you selected, there's a profile. I can create a nice example, so that will be the election outcome. <laughs> now, flip the plot whatever way you want, not using that many words. So, what happens is this extends, because remember, I already told you about the plurality vote. And I told you what uh, Borda said. He says, no, I use just one point for a first place candidate and zero for the others. Let's put you know, the number of points we give for first, second, third, and fourth. And it extends to almost all other possible choices of weights we're going to use for counting the ballots that same ugly pair of holes. And to make this mathematically precise, I give five points to my first place for five candidates, five points, uh, three points, pi over e points. Uh, some other number, uh, points, etc. What we can do, and then the others, we can compact them. And what we do is, with the weights, the weights are uh, form vectors in a higher dimensional space. And the real theorem is that there exists an algebraic variety. Don't worry about this. It just means highly rare. It's highly rare uh, system of weights where everything goes, where things go right, or in most cases, anything you want can happen. The chest is four. And the board account is the only method which always is in all of these varieties. The board account is the only method, obviously, I'm using orbits and symmetry groups to solve this thing. But the uh, board account is the only one which avoids a lot of these inconsistencies. Everything else you must expect will have huge numbers of inconsistencies. Thanks, Lauren. Let me show you how bad. For seven candidates, for seven candidates, what I'm going to do is the following: is I'm going to write down the number of lists of horrible things, election outcomes that can happen with the plurality vote. So I write down the election ranking for the seven candidates. For the seven sets of six, I write down the election ranking, and I get this concatenated mess. And then I write down all possible election rankings that can possibly occur with some example. Then I do it with the board account. Now I already told you that the board account doesn't have as many things going wrong. Well, how good is it? Well, if the num multiple would be 10, that would say that for any list of rankings that you have for the board account of things of inconsistencies and things like this, I can modify it in 10 different ways to get things that go wrong with the plurality or any other method. But the answer really isn't 10, it's 10 to the 50th. <laughs> now, let me remind you of 10 to the 50th. 10 to the 50th is larger than a billion times the number of water droplets in all of the oceans of the world. You got that huge, ugly number, and that's a number of ways you can modify the number of things that go wrong with the border list to get things that go wrong with the plurality. But can go wrong with some of these methods, it's not just a little bit wrong, it's mind-boggling wrong. And I really don't trust election outcomes for the plurality vote at all. So what's the mathematician's next question? Why? And I find a way to find what causes all of these problems that go on. Is there an underlying systematic mathematical structure that explains it? And to explain this, I have to tell you that I have a consulting business. For a price, I will come to your organization before your next election. You tell, me, <laughs> you tell me who you want to win. <laughs> I will talk to the individuals, and I will then create a fair election method 
one in which every candidate is being considered, and your candidate will win. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe, I wonder if there's a cause and effect relationship, but in our department, they don't want me to decide. <laughs> Show the rules. I understand that. But let, let, let's take a look and see if we can illustrate this. Suppose we have 10 people that prefer Anne to Barb to Connie to Deanna to Elaine to Brett. I've got 10 more who prefer Bonnie, Bonnie Barbara to Connie to Deanna to Elaine to Brett. And I've got 10 more who prefer Connie to Deanna to Elaine to Brett. Who would you like me to elect? Brett. 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 Well, you know, to elect Fred, I may have to charge you a little more. <laughs> because everyone, everyone prefers Connie to Deanna to Elaine to Fred. There's no one in here by the name of Fred. So let me, let me ask you, can anyone help me? Uh, can I subcontract out anything? Anyone can tell me how to elect Any person in the department chair right now would have gone to this. Get rid of C, P, and E. Ah, some of them get rid of C, P, and E. <laughs> <laughs> I used to come from Chicago. I was in Chicago for 30 years. <laughs> we found that no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Why all this? The mathematics is 
something that I call a ranking wheel. What's a ranking wheel? Just, just going to attach it on the wall. <coughs> and on your wheel, what you're going to do is put the knife six candidates and write the candidates one, two, three, four, five, six, evenly spaced all the way around. <coughs> Then on the wall itself, I'm going to put the names of the candidates in somewhere. Notice A is right under, above the 1, B is right by the 2. So that's their ranking. And so there's their ranking, and notice that's how I got that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it 60 degrees. 1 is by the B, 2 is by the C, etc. There we have our ranking. That's that ring. And we continue, except I'm going to uh, do this. The first three, all you need to get a cycle. All you need are three rankings from this ranking wheel construction to get a cycle. But I'm going to go all the way through until I get all six rankings. And what I get is something where no candidate is favored. Each candidate is in first place. Second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place, sixth place, precisely once, and so no candidate is favored over the others. But the pairwise ranking, the pairwise ranking, what it does is it gives you a cycle. It gives you a cycle of five to one. And the reason for this is lost information. Let me show you the information. The pairwise mode puts on blinders. It puts on blinders. It cannot see the full structure. And what it does, for example, is it sees that B is above C, B is above C. The only time B is not above C is right there. So five of the six times B will be above C. And what is this? This is uh, nothing more than a C6 orbit. In general, you have a Cn orbit for the symmetry structure. And the theorem surprised the heck out of myself. The theorem is that this is the source of all cycles. Whether it comes from voting, statistics, probability, any of these different areas. If you look, you'll see there's a huge, huge, huge in all of these areas, a huge literature on the cause and source of cycles and where they came Really is from this simple symmetry structure. That's it. Reason again for the symmetry structure is that the pairwise mode concentrates only on a particular pair and throws away all other information. All other information is dismissed. And I'm going to use this to explain arrows. In my abstract, I found out. <laughs> I was going to introduce Arrow's theorem and tell you why it doesn't mean what Arrow said and what we have thought for the last half century. Arrow's theorem says that the voter's preferences are transitive, no restrictions. In other words, if you prefer and the mark and mark it's going to be transitive and says that the outputs, the societal ranking, has to be transitive. In particular, we don't want to have a cycle. We don't want to have and better than bar, bar better than tiny, tiny better than a and. So you don't want to have that. So we want the outcome to be transitive. Notice the two conditions transitive. Transitive, then there's no reason to believe that the societal ranking is transitive. So a key assumption here is that the voters have transitive preferences because otherwise, hey, you had preferences, A, and bar, bar, cunning, cunning, and and other people, why should we believe the societal outcome? Why do we believe it would have more structure than the voters? And so that's a crucial, crucial question. Now about the voting rule. The voting rule has uh, the following conditions on it. If everybody in this room prefers and to bar, then that better be the societal ranking. If it isn't, you wonder, are we in Moscow or something? It's not. 
And so that is the societal ranking. And the next one is, is why get anonymity? Let me give you an example of uh, where this happened. Remember when figure skating became a contact sport? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the year after that Olympics, there was a in England, there was a large uh, figure skating tournament. And a young blonde from Detroit. Well, she had some controversial past. And then there was a young woman from France who did the past. Crawl past the A block first. 
block second. The B block second. The C block third. They're all in the correct order. Well, that's right. Well, I, I guess I should tell you that I arranged the blocks in the only possible way. <laughs> Yeah. 
look at the uh, boundary, it turns out that the ones with the greatest likelihood for a tie is the plurality vote rate. Or a vote for two, right there. But the least is the more common. Right. Uh, I noticed that all of your examples, uh, everyone waits to say one. But in some voting systems, people are given a set uh, number of points which they can allocate as they choose. Yep. Yeah. Like strong preferences. Yeah. Uh, how does that relate? It turns out to be a nightmare. Uh, what happens is we have one voting system like that that we use in the Mass Association of America and American Mass Society. It's called, we heard about Rob's a little while ago. Rob's is one of the ones who invented it, and it's called approval voting. In approval voting, you can vote yes or yay or nay on each candidate, and you just count them up. It turns out that almost always you can have, well, with the beverage example, anybody can get elected, and you can have any ranking you want just by use of approval voting, all 13 possible rankings. And what happened, let me give you an example just because that would be another little bit of lecture. Let me just give you an example. Suppose we had approval voting in 1992 when we had Perot, uh, Clinton, and Father Bush. Now, no one's going to vote for all, all three. <laughs> 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 because if you vote for all three, your vote just doesn't count. If you had either Clinton or Bush in your top two, would you vote for them? For both of them? No, because you're not distinguishing between them. So if you had Clinton and Bush as your number one and number two in some order, or reverse it, you would not use approval voting because what you will do is you're essentially not helping to make a decision, a distinction in the uh, real two candidates. If you had Perot number one, you're only going to vote for Perot so that you can make a statement. As a result, the only people that would vote for two is if you had Perot's second rank. We would have had President Perot by the figures. And so uh, another case that came up right there when I heard about approval voting, this is before I started looking at it. And I was chair of the math department. And they called me and said, we're going to be electing a committee to select a new president. Of Northwestern. They said, uh, what about this approval voting? I said, hey, it sounds good. The chair of the history department called me and he says, did you hear this ridiculous method they're using? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, uh, well, what do you find wrong with it? He says, well, the history department, because we're going to be elected six, the history department, We'll select three people in the math department. You select three. Uh, both departments will vote for all six. We'll get our six candidates in. Guaranteed. I won't tell you what we did. <laughs> but I have to tell you, and I think I should conclude because it's getting uh, a bit later. I sort of private questions after. But I have to tell you that while the board account is mathematically the best, and if you want to find faults with it, if you know the mathematical structure, you can easily go back and Use the structure to find how they handle the problems of strategic voting, people not voting for all candidates. Once you know the systematic, this is my word systematic, once you understand what goes wrong, you can solve these problems. But approval, I mean, uh, uh, board account is not always the best. When I was at Northwestern, I didn't have the sharp results I had, uh, but I had uh, preliminary results. And the department, math department, said, Don, come on, come on, give a lecture here. You're giving lectures everywhere else. I said, no. Come on, Don, give a lecture. Finally, I had to give a lecture. I gave a lecture, and the worst thing possible happened the next day. They selected the voting system through the board account. And the reason I didn't want the board account is I knew that we were getting distorted <laughs> outcomes from the previous method. But I like them. I was being kept off of committee. And once that happened, I was nailed. I really think that that probably should. Well, thank you again. Thank you for coming. Um, I just want to make a few quick acknowledgments before we uh, finish. Um, so, of course, we should thank all of our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have been able to 
PayPal and things that you need to get paid for, uh, which is a lot.